Hello everyone and welcome to Edu Science Clinics. I am Dr. Gunjan Desai and today we are going to study a very recent article on enhanced recovery after surgery protocols and this one is on colorectal surgery. It is a 2025 article. It's an open access guideline based in surgery from the journal for perioperative care in elective colorectal surgery. So we have already discussed ERAS protocols in two separate videos in the past. So if you have not seen them to understand what is ERAS, enhanced recovery after surgery, we have discussed the Henrik Kellett, the pioneer behind the development of ERAS as a concept, the ERAS society and the first ERAS guidelines. We have also seen the basic ERAS protocol which comprises of pre-operative, intra-operative and post-operative measures that help in improving the recovery process in the patients who are admitted for surgery. Of course, remember that audit is a very important part when it comes to ERAS protocols and we will see how you can do that in colorectal surgery as well. So we have a video on the basics of ERAS where all these points are covered. We have a video on basics of ERAS in liver surgery, which was a guideline published by the society. So now today we are going to study the ERAS protocols for colorectal 2025. So like I said, if you have not seen those videos, please see them because then understanding this video is very easy. So as we know, ERAS has three components, pre-operative, intra-operative and post-operative. So in colorectal surgery, there will be some specific points that are not mentioned in the general guideline and there will be some points that are same as what we follow in other surgeries. So going into the pre-operative workup, as is always now recommended, the patients need to be explained about the procedure, stoma, colorectal surgery. So stoma is a very important content when you are discussing with your patients, the types of surgery that you are going to perform. So we have a video on colorectal surgery basics based on anatomy. You can see that as well. So the point is that if you discuss all these points with your patient before the surgery and counsel them, it will allay their anxiety and it may improve the post-operative recovery. When it comes to pre-operative optimization, this is a very important component in the current world. And we know that if we are optimizing the patient pre-operatively, the post-operative recovery is improved, regardless of the type of surgery that we are performing. So here, the high-risk patients specifically include patients with lung disease, heart disease, Patients who need to be optimized, if they are smoking, you need to stop smoking at least four weeks before surgery. Alcohol advice to stop at least four weeks before surgery. However, now for alcohol, the recommendation is turned from strong to weak, but for smoking, it is still very strong. So smoking cessation for at least four weeks, alcohol cessation, comorbidity management and building the patient's Fitness before surgery is very important. There is no specific prehabilitation regimen that has been recommended, but we all know there are things like, say, walking some specific distance before surgery, climbing stairs, doing chest physiotherapy, and high protein nutritious diet. All these points are simple parts of prehabilitation. When it comes to anemia, this is specific for colorectal surgery, especially because these patients many times have bleeding per rectum and their hemoglobin is many times less than 10, sometimes even less than 5. So they have recommended preoperative iron supplementation as well as erythropoietin, weekly recommended. Artificial is the preoperative iron supplementation if you have enough time before surgery. So Important preoperative point is nutrition. Immunonutrition is now also a part of the current guideline, so you can focus on that as well. Routine nutritional screening using the must screening tool or any other tool that your department loses routinely. If you want to see nutrition, we have a podcast of five videos on nutrition where everything is covered from nutritional screening to Enteral and parenteral nutrition. So you can go through those videos in detail. 
Noise and vomiting prophylaxis is a very important component because this is strongly recommended and this definitely improves outcomes if you control it well. There are five different drugs that have been recommended in the guideline: aprepitant, remosetron, granisetron, dexamethasone, and ondansetron. When it comes to sedation and anxiolytics in pre-operative phase, it does not show any benefit. Thromboprophylaxis is more in intraoperative phase where we use intermittent pneumatic compression devices along with prophylaxis in the form of enoxaparin. Mechanical bowel preparation and now the recommendations are very clear that you can avoid it in colonic surgery but you can consider it in rectal surgery. And whenever you are using bowel preparation, only mechanical bowel prep is not going to benefit. If you are going to use it, you have to combine it with use of oral antibiotics. Preoperative fasting. Now we know that the shorter fasting is preferred. Six hours for solids, two hours for liquids. This helps in improving insulin sensitivity and also reduces post-operative nausea and vomiting. Carbohydrate loading preoperatively is recommended, but it has not become a standard of care in a lot of centers. There are different formulas that are available for preoperative carbohydrate loading, but overall the uptake of this practice has not been standardized so far across institutions. Antibiotic prophylaxis is more or less the same as per other surgeries. IV antibiotics within 60 minutes before incision and repeat it if the surgery is prolonged or there is a lot of blood loss. Skin preparation is more or less the same. Fluid therapy, we have a separate table on it in the guideline, but it's goal-directed fluid therapy or goal-directed hemodynamic therapy is a better word because these patients many times have low hemoglobin as well. So now coming to intraoperative protocols, the Anesthesia protocol, you can use short acting agent, you can use the BIS monitoring and different anti-inflammatory strategies, avoid hypotension and ensure complete neuromuscular block reversal with TOF monitoring, train of four monitoring. Normothermia always recommended in any surgery and the various warming mechanisms like inline warmers as well as bear huggers are recommended during the surgery. Fluid balance, like I said, we are now shifting to a slightly positive fluid balance, a goal-directed fluid or hemodynamic therapy. In colorectal surgery, of course, MIS is being recommended and it will become the standard of care. When you combine MIS with ERAS protocols, it's definitely going to benefit the patients. Abdominal drainage routine is not recommended, but this is more for colonic rejection and not for rectal rejection. As far as individual practice goes, we still do abdominal drainage in routine in all patients because these patients have already undergone radiation or neoadjuvant therapy and putting a drain in most of them has been the standard practice across institutions. Now coming to post-operative care, we know that nasogastric tube removal early is recommended, sugar control is required, fluid balance, we'll see a table, but the recommendation now is to be slightly on the positive side than on negative side. Urinary catheters, we all know, should be removed early. Ileus prevention, we have a separate table for post-operative analgesia as well, but what we do is we avoid using NSAIDs. You start with paracetamol, you can use epidural, you can use patient control analgesia. Early gut feeding is recommended. We usually start within the 24 hours after surgery, at least liquids, and then you go towards solids. Early post-operative mobilization, usually after MIS on the day of surgery, open surgery, you start it after 24 hours once the patient's pain is managed. Now, when it comes to ileus prevention, we know that early oral feeding is beneficial. Epidural analgesia is beneficial. Bowel preparation does not help. And probiotic or selective opioid antagonists are effective. They can be used, but it is not a recommendation. Chewing gums routinely used in colorectal units. They are definitely helpful in reducing ileus and shortening the time to flatus and stool.
when it comes to osmotic laxatives and stimulant laxatives they may be effective there is moderate evidence for all these points ketorolac we use ketorolac patches as pain relief rather than using opioids and they are also beneficial a lot of patients have suggested that coffee helps them in first bowel movement but the study and quality of evidence is low post operative analgesia like i said we start with acetaminophen tap blocks and epidural analgesia so these are the three agents that are routinely used quadratus lumborum block not routinely used selective opioid antagon is also not routinely used and not preferred also and said then cox2 specific inhibitors we have also been using but limited quantity the first line of analgesia is paracetamol epidural is routinely used in colorectal surgery and if epidural is not performed for any reason like delayed inr inr or spinal deformities then tamp blocks are also very helpful like i said when it comes to perioperative fluid management the current recommendation is gold directed fluid therapy or gold directed hemodynamic therapy it is supposed to decrease morbidity especially in high risk patients so that is one area where this has benefited slightly positive fluid balance is the current recommendation it is not that you restrict iv fluids on the day because this increases the risk of aki as well as ssi acute kidney injury as well as surgical site infection and a strong recommendation so restrictive fluid policy is something that should be avoided and this is a strong recommendation probably the only strong recommendation is to avoid a restricted fluid policy so what we follow is gold directed fluid therapy or gold directed hemodynamic therapy where you monitor the patient for parameters of good hydration and monitor your fluid balance accordingly and based on that keep it slightly positive rather than negative so that is what is recommended so that is in a nutshell all the components of eras when it pertains to colorectal surgery specific points include bowel preparation antibiotic prophylaxis in colorectal surgery counseling for stoma a very important point marking the stoma site again an important point intraoperatively use of mis minimal invasive surgery use of drains yes or no post operatively early removal of tubes early mobilization avoid opioids stick to basics and early drain removal once you are comfortable if you have put a drain so basically these are the points that help in the enhanced recovery protocols usually these days the patients go home by the fourth or fifth day based on your centers and departments policy again an important point if you are following all these protocols is to audit your data keep a record of how many patients you have done of eras remember that these guidelines are for elective surgery and this is because all of us have burned our fingers when you try to do eras in stage 4 patients they are very different from the other age group they have received neoadjuvant chemotherapy the bodies are weak and for some reason stage 4 patients don't do as well on eras as the other group of patients so elective colorectal surgery and personally not applying it to stage 4 patients is something that we have been following so of course you can check it with your department and the experience of the professors there and follow eras protocols accordingly if you have any new findings you should share them publish data review and reassess and implement the findings that you feel are important in recovery of your patients thank you